Queen Victoria married a man she loved and was very happy throughout their marriage, having nine children. However, she always expressed her dislike for being pregnant and also showed her lack of appreciation for babies, whom she considered as ugly as toads. Such was Queen Victoria, and everything was recorded by her in the various diaries she left behind. Each of her nine children reached adulthood. Princess Louise was one of the most criticized and, at the same time, admired princesses of her time. A liberal woman, endowed with artistic talent and intellectually brilliant, independent, her figure contrasted with the strict Victorian court, generating numerous rumors about her. Among them, the birth of an illegitimate child stands out. Of all Queen Victoria's daughters, Louise had the most tumultuous life, full of lovers. It was also said that her husband, Lorne, was homosexual. Princess Louise of the United Kingdom was born on March 18, 1848, at Buckingham Palace in London, as the sixth daughter of Queen Victoria of the United Kingdom and Prince Albert of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha. Her birth was notable as the first in which the Queen used chloroform. Baptized as Louise Caroline Alberta, like all her other siblings, she had a rigorous education following a program created by her father, Prince Albert. In addition to conventional studies, the children also learned practical skills in a little chalet he had built on the Isle of Wight so that they could learn various trades. However, Louise showed a great artistic talent from a very young age. Despite this, an artistic career was not considered for her due to her position in the royal family. Nevertheless, Queen Victoria allowed her to study art and enroll in the National Art Training School in South Kensington. In addition to her artistic aptitude, Louise excelled as a skilled dancer. Her intelligence and curiosity made her a favorite of her father, affectionately nicknamed Little Miss Y by members of the British royal family. However, after the death of Prince Albert in December 1861, Queen Victoria was devastated and transferred her residence to Osborne House on the Isle of Wight. Louise had to abandon all her occupations to become her mother's secretary during those difficult times, as the Queen could barely handle state affairs due to her profound sadness. The princess began to feel bored because, at that time, there was no social involvement in the court, and she lived practically isolated alongside her mother and siblings who had not yet married. The atmosphere in the court became bleak, and entertainment was almost non-existent. Louise was a girl of strong character, affectionate, and very attractive. Many claimed that she was the most beautiful daughter of Queen Victoria, surpassing all her sisters in beauty. As the years passed, the princess began to consider that her mother's mourning was excessively exaggerated. Unsatisfied with her mother's prolonged mourning, she requested in 1865 to open the ballroom on her birthday, but the queen strictly denied it due to mourning, even though four years had passed since her husband's death. Louise felt increasingly bored, which deeply irritated her mother, Queen Victoria, who considered her indiscreet, selfish, and unfeeling. In the midst of such boredom and being a curious and energetic young woman, it is not surprising that she did her best to pass the time and began to closely follow the lessons that her brother Leopold received from his tutor, the strong and handsome Lieutenant Walter George Sterling. Here is the first major rumor, which was never confirmed, about Princess Louise. In March 1866, Lieutenant Walter George Sterling was hired as a tutor and took care of Princess Louise's brother, Prince Leopold, who suffered from hemophilia. He quickly became a valuable member of the royal family. Sterling participated in various outings, parties, and family dinners. He almost never left Leopold's side and subsequently spent a lot of time in the company of Princess Louise, who often visited her sick brother. Despite Leopold improving under Sterling's care, Queen Victoria suddenly dismissed Sterling just four months later, with little or no explanation. Rumors quickly spread throughout the royal household, and a year later, more rumors began, saying that Sterling had actually impregnated Princess Louise. Everyone suspected a lot when Princess Louise's style of dress changed dramatically during the year 1866. Normally, she wore simple and tight dresses, but that year, her style became much more decorated, with ruffles and pleats, and she was often seen wearing accessories and shawls and photographs that usually covered her abdomen. In the fall of that year, 
Victoria herself noted in her diary that Louise, on that date, no longer needed servants to help her dress, suggesting that she was trying to hide a possible pregnancy. It was also, very strange that the princess made few public appearances in the winter of 1866, and when she did, she rarely left her carriage. Another piece of evidence of her possible pregnancy is that the princess was not herself, she wrote to a friend that she was feeling sad and melancholic. A passage from the letter said, I sit in my room and cry. I can't write and tell you because there are so many things that shouldn't be as they are. What they expect from me is that I agree with them, and yet I can't because I know something is wrong. Just before the suspected birth, Queen Victoria's gynecologist, Sir Charles Laycock, moved into an apartment at St. James's Palace. Near the end of 1866, the gynecologist's son, Frederick Lowcock, adopted a baby named Harry Lowcock. A few weeks after the adoption, Sir Charles received a visit from Lady Sterling, the mother of Lieutenant Walter Sterling, the suspected father. Suddenly, Frederick Lowcock began receiving a large and unexplained allowance, suggesting royal involvement. According to the Lowcock family, the princess visited Harry throughout his childhood, until he turned 16. His descendants tried to confirm his identity through DNA analysis, but British courts never officially allowed it. Louise continued to fill the position of unofficial secretary in 1866, and despite Queen Victoria's initial concerns, she performed well in the role, described as a smart, strong-willed, altruistic, and affectionate young woman. However, it seems that she eventually fell in love with Robinson Duckworth around 1870. Queen Victoria reacted by dismissing the services of the Reverend, who later became a canon at Westminster Abbey. The press constantly accused her of involvement with men. Additionally, she was a very liberal young woman who cared about the cause and rights of women, which greatly concerned her mother. Queen Victoria quickly began looking for a suitable husband for her. Being so beautiful and an excellent match, many suitors expressed interest. The Princess of Wales, Alexandra, who was her sister-in-law, suggested her brother, the Crown Prince of Denmark, Frederick, but the Queen strongly opposed, fearing that another Danish union might upset Prussia. From Prussia, Louise's older sister, Princess Victoria, proposed her marriage to Prince Albert. However, Victoria also did not desire another Prussian Union due to delicate political matters. Prince William, Prince of Orange, was also considered, but his extravagant life in Paris with various mistresses led the Queen to quickly reject that idea. Victoria then set her sights on a candidate she deemed suitable, John Campbell, Marquess of Lorne. Heir to the Duke of Argyle, he had a romantic appearance with blonde hair and piercing blue eyes, was cultured, well-traveled, something common for the time. Moreover, he had been to the United States, written articles, dabbled as a poet, and was politically active as a member of parliament. Princess Louise agreed and expressed her desire to marry John Campbell, Marquess of Lorne. This proposal challenged tradition, as no marriage between the daughter of a British sovereign and a subject had occurred since 1515. Her older brother, Prince Edward, strongly opposed the union with a nobleman who was not well known. Despite the opposition, Queen Victoria supported Louise's decision, arguing that changing times made marriages with major foreign alliances less desirable. In 1869, she wrote to Prince Edward, stating that Louise's marriage to a subject would bring fresh blood to the royal family, strengthening it morally and physically. Victoria believed that this union would not pose social position difficulties, keeping the princess in her place while her husband occupied his position, treated as a relative only when they were together. They became engaged on October 3, 1870. The marriage proposal took place during a stroll at Balmoral Castle in Scotland, where he expressed his devotion to the princess. The wedding ceremony took place at the St. George's Chapel on March 21, 1871. Louise wore the wedding veil she had designed herself, being escorted to the chapel by her mother and her two elder brothers. After the ceremony, the couple traveled to Claremont House for their honeymoon, 
but the constant presence of attendants made privacy difficult, and the Queen also visited them during their honeymoon. In 1878, Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli chose the Marquess of Lorne as the new Governor General of Canada, and Victoria appointed him to the position. Thus, the princess became the consort of her husband, and the couple arrived on November 25, 1878, at the Queen's official residence in Ottawa. Despite initially positive expectations of a strong connection between Louise and the Canadians, the couple's arrival was not well received by the local press, which protested against the imposition of royalty in a society unfamiliar with monarchy. She was, simply dismayed by the unfavorable and active publicity about the couple's presence there. However, initial concerns about a rigid court were unfounded, they proved to be more relaxed than their predecessors. In the first months in Canada, Louise faced great sadness over the death of her favorite sister, Princess Alice, in December 1878. That Christmas, she sorely missed her home but quickly adapted to the Canadian winter, enjoying activities such as skating and sledding in the snow. The couple hosted frequent dinners to get to know the members of Parliament, and the court was accessible to anyone in proper attire. Louise's first state ball was impressive when she requested the removal of the cord that separated common guests from the royal entourage. Louise and Lorne founded the Royal Canadian Academy of Arts, and she became involved in charitable activities as a patron of various organizations in Montreal. Additionally, she contributed as a sculptor, creating a statue of her mother. On February 14, 1880, she, her husband, and two attendants faced a sleigh accident during a particularly harsh winter. The carriage overturned, throwing the coachman and footman away, while the horses panicked and dragged the overturned carriage for over 370 meters. Louise lost consciousness after hitting her head on the iron bar supporting the roof, while Lorne was trapped underneath her, fearing the carriage might collapse at any moment. Doctors diagnosed a severe trauma in Louise, highlighting it as a miracle that her skull had not been fractured. The princess's ear was injured when her earring caught on the side of the sleigh, tearing her lobe. But the gravity of the accident was downplayed by the press, following the instructions of her husband's private secretary, which was considered a significant mistake. This led to a misunderstood interpretation by the public, believing that Louise was pretending to be unwell by cancelling immediate commitments. Even in the United Kingdom, the news was played down in letters to Victoria, who was anxious and nervous. The couple finally returned to England in 1883, taking up residence at Kensington Palace, prepared by Victoria. But Louise continued to show a continued interest in Canada. During the Saskatchewan Rebellion in 1885, involving Canadian indigenous people and Métis, she sent Dr. Boyd with medical supplies and a large sum of money to help, with her explicit guidance to assist both sides of the rebellion. In London, her husband resumed his political career, running unsuccessfully for a seat in the House of Commons in 1885. The relationship between Louise and Lorne deteriorated, often living separately, influenced by political differences, the absence of children, and restrictions imposed by her mother, Victoria. Rumors about Lorne's alleged homosexuality surfaced, further distancing the couple. Additionally, her husband was the only member of the royal family to clearly identify with a political party, making him unwelcome at the court, especially by the Prince of Wales, Edward. Louise's relationships with her sisters Beatrice and Helena also deteriorated. Beatrice, married to Prince Harry of Badenburg, was constantly assisted by the Queen, causing jealousy in Louise. Unlike her, Beatrice and Helena had satisfactory relationships with their husbands and children, and the fact that she could not have children was something that truly affected Princess Louise. And more rumors came to disturb her, this time suggesting that she was romantically involved with Arthur Bigger, Queen Victoria's private secretary. Her sister Beatrice expressed concern about these rumors, considering them a scandal. Princess Louise vehemently denied the rumors, claiming that her sisters Beatrice and Helena spread them to undermine her position at the court. 
The fact is that strong rumors spread accusing both Louise and her husband Lorne of having love affairs. While he always sought male companionship, she had several affairs with other men. The princess always denied this. Another of her alleged romances was with the sculptor Joseph Bowen, who would die in his own studio in her presence. Some even claimed that he passed away during an intimate encounter with Louise. Other romantic entanglements were associated with the princess. However, all these cases were never confirmed. During the last years of Queen Victoria's reign, Louise played various public roles, inaugurating buildings, laying foundation stones, and supporting women's suffrage and the freedom of women to choose certain professions, such as that of a doctor. Queen Victoria thought that a woman doctor was simply repulsive. Louise went so far as to visit Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, the first female doctor in England, despite the Queen's opposition. She also had a certain obsession with physical health, always taking great care of her body, displaying a slender figure. She sought to be recognized as an ordinary person, often using the name Mrs. Campbell in her international travels. Known for her generosity, she showed compassion for her servants. In an incident when her butler approached her about the dismissal of a footman who was habitually late, Louise suggested solutions, including an alarm clock and even a bed that would eject him at specific times. In the end, it was discovered that the footman was unwell. During a visit to Bermuda, feeling thirsty, she stopped at a house and asked a woman for water. When she realized she was not recognized, she offered to help the woman with household chores. In 1901, with the death of her mother, Queen Victoria, Louise seamlessly integrated into the now more permissive and relaxed moral era of her brother, the new King Edward VII. Again, she was heavily criticized for engaging in conversations with men and smoking in public. Nevertheless, she didn't care much about the criticism and continued to do so. In 1910, her husband became the Duke of Argyle, and in that same year, her brother, King Edward VII, passed away, and her husband began to gradually become senile. Louise devoted herself intensely to the care of her husband with great affection during these years, and the couple became more united than ever. In the year 1914, her husband passed away after various health complications. Following the Duke's death, Louise suffered a mental breakdown, facing loneliness and expressing, in a letter, the intensity of the void left by her husband's absence, my loneliness without the Duke is terrible. What am I going to do without him now? She spent her last years at Kensington Palace, and her presence at public events diminished due to the deterioration of her health. In 1935, she received a visit from her nephew, King George V, and Queen Mary of Teck, during the celebrations of the King's Silver Jubilee. At this event, she was named the Honorary Freewoman of the Kensington Neighborhood. Louise's last public appearance was in 1937 at the Exhibition of Arts and Industries. With the ascension of King George VI, she remained confined in Kensington, affectionately called Aunt Palace by Princesses Elizabeth and Margaret. Princess Louise was a direct witness to the reigns of her mother, Queen Victoria, her brother, Edward VII, her nephew, George V, and also the brief reign of her nephew, Edward VIII, and her nephew George VI. She passed away at the age of 91 at Kensington Palace on December 3, 1939, wearing the bridal veil she had worn almost seven decades earlier. Due to the onset of World War II, her funeral was simple, and she was cremated. Currently, her ashes rest in the Royal Cemetery of Frogmore, near Windsor Castle.